Not only does Poets.org provide us with the poem itself and the photo of the artist, in this case being Derek Walcott, it also provides us with an audio recording of he himself reading his own poem. I feel like he can do it a lot more justice than I ever could. So we're gonna listen to the audio recording they provided. Also, I have my, my mic hooked up, yes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm happy because last time I did not, and that really sucked. Yeah, we're just gonna listen to his recording of it, and I hope you all enjoy. Right after, I'm going to go to a separate document where I've copy and pasted his poem, and I'll be uh, breaking it down line by line. So I hope you all enjoy. Far Cry from Africa. And the, the title of the poem is ambiguous. It's supposed to mean a cry of torture and also a cry of distance. A wind is ruffling the tawny pelt of Africa. Kikuyu, quick as flies, batten upon the bloodstreams of the veldt. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm, Colonel of Carrion, cries, Waste no compassion on these separate dead. Statistics justify and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy. What is that to the white child hacked in bed, to savages expendable as Jews? Threshed out by beaters, the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilizations dawn from the parched river or beast teeming plain. The violence of beast on beast is read as natural law, but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain. Delirious as these worried beasts, his wars dance to the tightened carcass of a drum, while he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead. Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. Again, a waste of our compassion as with Spain the gorilla wrestles with the Superman. I who am poisoned with the blood of both, where shall I turn, divided to the vein? I who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? Betray them both or give back what they give? How can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa and live? Okay, so now that we've heard Derek Walcott himself recite the poem, we're going to go through a line-by-line -line breakdown of what poetic devices he was utilizing to best convey his message. A Far Cry from Africa is a poem of witness. A witness to what? Well, you'll find out as we read through the poem. It was published in 1962. As he himself stated in the recording you just watched, it is actually a double entendre. A far cry from Africa can mean a long distance away from Africa, but can also mean a cry of sorrow coming from within Africa. And you'll find out what exactly he's referring to when we get into the poem. Some context about Derek Walcott. He's a West Indies poet of English and African descent who spent much of his time in a British owned island. This becomes very relevant to the rest of the poem. And you might be saying to yourself, well, Kendrick, the speaker isn't always the poet. And although that is true, in this case, the speaker is the poet. The first line says, a wind is ruffling the tawny pelt of Africa. Tawny being brown, pelt being fur or outer skin. So he's saying the brownish fur of Africa. This can refer to the African skin due to the color and the mention of pelt. Uh, but it can also just refer to the rugged terrain of Africa as well. So he starts off by using beastly imagery to describe Africa. And this is a this is a pattern that continues throughout the entire work. Kikuyu is a Bantu ethnic group in central Kenya. It's actually the largest ethnic group in Kenya. And Kenya gained its independence in 1963. 1963 being a year right after the poem was published. So you can see now that this poem is providing context for the events that led up to the independence of Kenya. Badden upon the bloodstreams of the veldt. Bloodstreams is a bit, there's a bit of wordplay there. Streams typically flow through land, uh, like grasslands providing nutrients and things like that. But in this case, the streams aren't made of water, they're made of blood. So you already know that there's a lot of bloodshed and violence that's gonna be involved uh, through the rest of the events that he's describing. Veldt here, veldt is just like flat grasslands that are found in Africa. And 
there's two spellings of Velt. He chose V-E-L-D-T as opposed to just V-E-L-D because he wanted it to rhyme with pelt. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm kernel of carrion cries. Waste no compassion on these separate dead. By describing corpses in a paradise, he's showing that there's a beautiful land that has been tainted by war. Worms eat decaying flesh and benefit off of the dead not being buried so that they can consume the flesh of the dead. Uh, this line makes sense now when he says, waste no compassion on these separate dead. The worm or the eater of decaying flesh would not want you to bury them, but would want you to leave them out. Now, Colonel of Carrion. A colonel is a position in the military. Carrion is decaying flesh. Hopefully that clears all of that up. Now you might be wondering why is he using the word kernel to describe a worm? You'll see in a second. Statistics justify and, so, and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy. Salience would be, it's like an area of battlefield that's surrounded by an enemy on multiple sides. So the people who are in a salient would be vulnerable to attack. And the salience in this case would be the Kenyan people. Now there's salience of colonial policy. So now he's confirming who exactly the oppressive power is, colonizers. And that is who he's referring to when he says, only the worm cries, waste no compassion on these separate dead. The worm is the kernel because the worm is the colonial power. The colonial power is using its oppressive force to subjugate uh, the Africans. He's very intelligent here. Colonial and kernel are spelled almost the same. And that kind of forces you to make the connection, okay, the colonial power is the worm. What is that to the white child hacked in bed, to savages expendable as Jews? Ask yourself, how does colonialism benefit the lowly and unfortunate members of European societies? It doesn't. So when uh, Britain is gaining benefits from the resources it's stripping from Kenya, uh, the low sickly members of society, the, lo the lower class individuals, they're not benefiting a lick from this and uh, neither are the Africans who are deemed savages. They're not benefiting from it either, although Britain would want you to think that they are. And in fact, to Britain, they're expendable just like Jews. In this case, expendable as Jews is a reference to the Holocaust. So he's likening a crime against humanity like the Holocaust to the tragedies being faced by Kenya. That's rough, <laughs> that's rough. Uh, he goes on to say, threshed out by beaters, the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civiliza civilization's dawn. Threshing is a sort of process of loosening the edible part of grain uh, from the straw that it's attached to. It happens through beating. So to extract the edible resources from the Kenyans, the British are effectively beating the Kenyans, the Africans, right? So that's, uh, he's using that imagery there. He goes on to say, in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn. An ibis is a type of bird that's known for its cry. It has a, a really special cry, which connects to the title, of course. Dust is common imagery for death, whose cries have wheeled since civilization's dawn. This is something that's been happening uh, for, for years now. It's been happening for ages. It's just the subjugation of, of the African people. From the parched river or beast teeming plain. So parched river in this case is referring to the dried up land. Uh, this could be due to drought, but it could also be due to the British stripping the land of its resources. So uh, I'm not entirely sure which one he's referring to. He could be referring to both. Derek Walcott's a master of uh, double entendres. Let me just be honest with you. <laughs> okay, he goes on to say the violence of beast on beast is red as natural law but upright man seeks his his divinity by inflicting pain. The violence of beast on beast is red. If you were just hearing this audibly without seeing the poem itself, red here could also be spelled R-E-D, which would make sense because violence being considered red, uh, well, blood is red, violence often leads to bloodshed. You see how that goes. But then when you keep reading, or if you were to keep hearing it and you weren't reading it, you'd realize in a second, oh, he doesn't just mean R-E-D, he means R-E-A-D, because the violence is read as natural law. As in, this is the way of life, this is the way things are. But upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain. So here he's sort of exposing the logical fallacy that the colonizers have. Uh, they think they're upright and holier than thou, and yet they're doing acts that are very cruel and very inhumane, uh, yet they're claiming to seek divinity or a higher level of existence. 
very contradictory there and he he breaks that down for us he says delirious as the worried beasts his wars dance to the titan carcass of a drum uh here again he's referring to the africans in a very beastly or animalistic description because that's how the british themselves viewed the um the africans of that time his wars dance to the titan carcass of a drum carcass would be like the the remnants of a dead body oftentimes drums would be made by taking the skin of a dead animal and stretching it out so that you can use it as a drum he's effectively saying the british are doing that to the africans that's that's more or less <laughs> that's more or less what he's saying there um and if you look at the fact that a drum is used for pacing music he's sort of saying that the pace and progression of the war is stretched out or prolonged with death. He goes on to say, while he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead, the colonizer might interpret the African resistance as courage, when in reality, it's dread for white influence. So they're not doing, they're not like defending themselves or fighting for their rights because they're courageous, it's because they know the alternative is much worse. <laughs> white peace contracted by the dead he's almost referring to uh white influence the service or contributions of white people to sort of help or civilize the africans he's almost referring to that white peace as a disease hence the earlier use of the word delirious uh, delirious often a word used to describe the unstable mental state of someone who is sick so if, if he's saying that um the worried beasts are sick sick from what well the white peace and the white piece that the Africans are contracting are killing them. He says, again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. Brutish? Look at the word brutish. Doesn't that look an awful lot like British? He's actually throwing in subliminal jabs at Britain. Brutish as a way of describing Britain. Brutish is like a word that means savage or not uh, civilized. So he's actually using that word to describe the British. Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause. So the British are sort of saying like, we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, we, uh, our hands are clean. When in reality, they're not because the very reason you're giving for your actions of colonizing are dirty in and of themselves. So your actions are automatically gonna be dirty because you're trying to wipe your hands with your reasoning when in fact your reasoning is flawed. He says, again, a waste of our compassion as with Spain. Now this is the first time he mentions himself in the poem. In the first and second stanza, he did not do this, but in the third stanza, stanza finally, he says, our compassion, as with Spain. Spain is a major, was also a major colonial power in the past. Uh, by the time Britain rose to its colonial height, Spain had sort of like fallen off that wagon, but still he's comparing uh, Spain's colonialism to that of Britain. He goes on to say, the gorilla wrestles with the Superman. Gorilla here can have two meanings. Gorilla referring to how the British perceived the Africans as beastly or animalistic, but it can also refer to the type of warfare that the Africans were utilizing, which would be guerrilla warfare. He says the gorilla wrestles with the Superman, the Superman being the British who consider themselves upright man seeking divinity. So they think they're like on a higher plane of existence as men. I who am poisoned with the blood of both. As stated before, Derek Walcott is both of African descent, but also of English descent. So he has a lot of like internal turmoil regarding his identity. And he says the word poisoned by both. So there's that really harsh imagery. You can see he's going through a lot of internal conflict. Where shall I turn divided to the vein? I mean, that that's just more exposition into his internal struggle with his identity. I who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule. To the speaker, it seems like the British rulers are drunk with power and overindulgence of the Africans' resources. Uh, so this is a sort of diss in that regard, but you can see it's also like a look inward at himself because he feels like due to his lineage, he's a part of all that, you know? How choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? He speaks English. He doesn't speak an African tongue or anything like that but africa is still rooted in his identity he looks african for crying out loud like he looks black you know um betray them both or give back what they give now this is harsh in and of itself because you, you can't give back the tongue you've already received so he's, he's looking at it almost like a curse like this 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 tongue i love so much that i'm even using to write the poem for crying out loud um it, I, I wish i could just give it back you know or like maybe if i just gave back my my african side um Maybe I wouldn't be feeling so much turmoil right now from witnessing what's going on. Um, how can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa 
and live. I mean, I think the rest of that speaks for itself. There's one thing I actually forgot to analyze. I was about to close out the video. I'm almost done, y'all, almost done. If you look, there's a lot of rhyme that he utilizes. In fact, in the first stanza, um, there's every end word rhymes with another end word except for Jews. In this case, expendable as Jews, he makes it stand out drastically, not only as a humanitarian concern of like the, the African suffering being similar to the Holocaust, but he also makes it stand out in that it's the only line that doesn't rhyme with anything else, in the first stanza at least. And he actually continues this trend of having some lines not rhyme with anything in the further stanzas, although rhyme is mostly maintained. Okay, so hopefully that explains everything there. I hope you enjoyed. Like, subscribe, comment below if you like the video or something you think I missed. Maybe some line that you think had another meaning that I might not have noticed. I'll be back with another one. Deuces.